Fritz, I'm delighted to, to welcome you uh, because um, you don't look like it, but uh, you're one of, uh, I mean, you don't look like it physically, but you're one of the most prominent uh, Chinese, uh, one of the prominent uh, entrepreneur, tech entrepreneur in China. You're American originally. Uh, you created uh, your second or third company, uh, Tuna, uh, um, some, some years ago. Um, and now it's Tuna everywhere. I was uh, in the subway uh, um, couple of weeks, no, three weeks ago, and there was Tuna, Tuna, Tuna everywhere. So Tuna is, is becoming a major brand in, uh, in uh, um, the, the, the tip sector we will talk about uh, earlier. So uh, some, some uh, people of uh, our international audience in particular, uh, the, the, the live streaming audience, you know, the conference is live stream uh, also overseas. Uh, I may not be very familiar with Tuna. Could you uh, tell us a little bit what Tuna is? Yeah, Frank, uh, uh, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, it, it's great to be back at um, China ICT. Tuna is, so Tuna means where are you going in Mandarin Chinese. Right. We're a travel website, yep. and we are a search engine. So we help consumers to aggregate all sorts of pricing, information and other content about flights, hotels, packages, car rental, cruises, in order to help those consumers filter that information and make better decisions. So that's essentially what we do, is we connect on one hand consumers, millions of Chinese travelers who want to spend money and travel the world with thousands of airlines, hoteliers, and agencies. We're just bringing two sides together using our search technology. Okay, can, can you give us a little bit of a, some, some, I don't like a lot of numbers, but just a few numbers to understand how big Tuna is right now? Right. We are, uh, according to um, some research reports such as iResearch and IDC, uh, Tuna is uh, China's largest travel website across all categories. And that equates to about, on a monthly basis, about 45 million unique visitors who come to the site and um, either do a query for a flight product or a hotel product or, or maybe a package or something like that. So it's about 45 million. Um, and a, and that, that equals about 200 million searches a month, which puts us worldwide as the largest uh, travel search engine as well. So, so the greatest thing about China is if you're a large player in China, you tend to be one of the largest in the world as well. What can I say? Uh, wow. <laughs> it's, it's, it, 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 it's amazing. Uh, w would you have been able to create a tuna uh, without the experience you had with your two previous ventures? I, I think... Um, you know, I think experience is, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, what does experience really mean? And uh, on one hand, this market is so dynamic and it changes so quickly that sometimes the experiences we have from prior projects may not be as relevant, um, especially when it comes to technology and business models and things like that. Um, however, um, it was interesting, um, you know, um, Pat Chan, he's the CEO and, and founder of Borks, one of the great wireless companies, he was saying... Fantastic that, company, who was um, one of our rising stars last year. Oh, great. Yeah, great. Fantastic and, gentleman. Yeah, it, great, yeah I mean, he's a great guy. And one of the funny things he said is, like, the CEO or the founders of a company, they're the first to hear the good news, and they're the first to hear the bad news. And I think experience allows you to handle the good news and the bad news in the right way. Um, well, I remember my first company, we, we had bad news and it was crushing. Or, or we had good news and I was extremely elated. Now when I hear good news and bad news, well, you're more like, okay, I've seen this before, this story hasn't played out. You know, I, I, I think that's what experience means sometimes, is, is to be able to handle the ups and downs and, and be able to handle challenges with some perspective, um, um, which, and maybe perspective and maturity, which um, I think um, is very useful. If, if anything, it, it improves your quality of life because you can sleep better. 
Which is very important. Uh, I mean, sleep is definitely not overrated when you are an entrepreneur. Uh, if you don't sleep well, I mean, you cannot work and perform well. And as an entrepreneur, you really need to perform well because if you don't, nobody else can do that for you. Um, Tuna is set to go IPO sometime soon. Can you confirm? Yeah, we um, I'm accessing uh, the financial markets is... Um, you know, it's very important for any company. It provides a competitive advantage. It helps some of our early investors to obtain some liquidity, stuff like that. And so it's, it's, it's something that we have to take seriously. And, 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 and obviously, this is a good time to access the public markets. Um, however, there, there are also um, other alternatives for funding as well. Um, and, and so we're just evaluating, and, and this is something we constantly do, by the way. This is, I mean, this is one of my jobs, is, is to constantly e evaluate the various resources and the ways we can get that. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's something we're thinking about. We have not made a firm decision whether we want to do that. We, uh, we think there's some excellent advantages to going public, um, but we think there's some disadvantages as well. And as your prior speaker, Nick, talked about, you know, funding is just one step in a long road towards greater successes. Um, and you can take that step through an IPO or, or possibly you can maybe raise some private capital through some private equity guys or something like that. So there's different ways and we just haven't made a final decision yet. But uh, when you're a VC-backed uh, company uh, anywhere in the world, but in particular in China, sometimes, I mean, your investors uh, are pushing you towards an IPO, right? How do you cope with that? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, I, I think one of the secrets is, you know, I guess interpersonal skills, meaning um, you, you, you certainly need to manage your investors. And, of course, sometimes your investors manage you as well. And, um, and, and, and yes, and, and so that's one of the considerations is, is, is we have to think about our shareholders because ultimately, like, I work for the shareholders. And that might mean to provide them some liquidity. And some of our investors clearly are very excited about this frothy market. Um, but other investors are like, we'd love to be long. It's, 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 it's one of the, if you talk to VC, one of the words that they love to use is we're long. You know, we want to be, you know, 10 years and to, to really focus on, you know, fantastic, you know, value creation. And, you know, it's, it's, it's something we think about, as I, just to repeat, it's something we think about. I think we've seen some fantastic companies. Um, I, I know that Alibaba waited a long time, but uh, kind of before spinning off, you know, their, um, one of their units in Hong Kong, and, and I, I think that was the right decision. Facebook is waiting, Twitter is waiting, Zing is waiting. So we're seeing some giants who are you know, very profitable, very successful companies waiting, and, and, you, and, and they certainly have their reasons for that, and you know, we um, you know, have our reasons as well. As an American entrepreneur, I said that, that earlier, you're, you're American from, from LA uh, originally, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I can. I don't have to, to say that I'm French because anybody can hear it, right? Uh, but um, as an American entrepreneur, why did you choose uh, to start your, 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 your venture in, in, in China? It, it, it wasn't that systematic, to be honest. You know, sometimes opportunities come to us. Um, I, I'll be the first to admit, I didn't think I was going to be in China for this long. Um, but one opportunity led to another, and after that, there was another one on, um, after that. Um, however, um, I do believe that the probability, uh, I, I think as an American entrepreneur here in China or a Chinese entrepreneur, I think in the States, I, I think the probability is the same to achieve success in North America or in China. Uh, wow. uh, this, this is what I really believe. It's, it's just how we achieve it might be different, mm -hmm. um, but I, I really believe the probability is the same. And, and if, in fact, you buy into that concept that it's the same, you know, why wouldn't you want to have a more interesting life? It's all about perception. Huh? Finally, it's all about perception. So, so looking backward, uh, you don't think that it would have been much easier to start your company in, in America? Well, sure. I mean, I, I think in some ways it would be easier. I mean, at least I can understand people, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean that's one thing. And, and, certain, and I, I, I think as Nick talked about earlier, you know, local market um, expertise is very important. And so those uh, sorts of things, I, 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 I think that would have been easier. But at the same time, I mean, in, in the U.S., I wouldn't be unique. I wouldn't be able to offer an outside perspective. What I think we have to think about when we start businesses is, you know, you know, you know, what's the value we as founders bring to the table? And usually you have two or three founders together 
and, and part of it's capital and part of it is our experience and expertise and things like that, but you know, what is it really? And you know, me and, and maybe some of the other foreigners, you know, we have Rich Robinson here and, and, and Jeremy and some of the other uh, you know, uh, well-established foreigners in, in this community and, and, and all of us, you know, we, we, you know, we kind of bring a certain perspective that you know, adds a bit of value and, 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 and so in one, ways, in, in, in one way it's kind of easier to be in China because of that. Um, what are the main obs obstacles you had to, to, go, to go through uh, as an entrepreneur, as a foreign entrepreneur uh, in, in China? Uh, you, you mentioned the language, but, but actually, you know, many people say that 80% of the communication is nonverbal. So, um, is the language really a big issue for, for a foreigner here? You know, I may I'll take a bet. Maybe it's a, a communication challenge, right? So, maybe it's not verbal, but maybe it's all that other junk, right? Um, the, the, the one thing that I, I would like to highlight is, you know, well, the, and, and there have been studies on this, and you know, it, it's kind of an oxymoron to do studies on entrepreneurship. I'm, I'm not sure that really makes any sense, but um, you know, they talk about you know some founders and, and successful entrepreneurs. I think one of the, the key character traits is to be self-aware, and, and being self-aware means just to recognize the wide range of weaknesses that one has as well as you know, kind of the strengths. And kind of to your point, you asked me, so what are some of the weaknesses or maybe limitations? Well, there's a bunch. Um, and, you know, and like I did those studies too, and, they, and I'm, I'm just very happy to you know, highlight all the weaknesses. And, it, and, 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 and in some ways, you know, those weaknesses are strengths because if, 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 if you buy into the fact that, well, okay, I'm a foreigner, so I don't really know what's going on, you ask the basic questions. And you know, sometimes you have to ask the basic questions to be successful. Um, and it just makes a lot of sense to me. I remember a couple of years ago we, ha we were having lunch together and you told me that actually not understanding Chinese, well you, you understand or quite, quite, quite some Chinese anyway, but n not understanding too much Chinese can be very helpful sometimes uh, to understand the other world situation, not maybe the, the, the details but the other world situation. Yeah, I, I think that's part of it. I don't want to make it sound like, wow, this is so easy, right? I mean, it's, it's clear that we have challenges, and I'm the first to admit I've had failures as well, no big deal. Um, but sometimes the fact that, you know, maybe I, you know, not as plugged into the market and being able to, you know, do things, the, the reality is, is like, I can't do anything. Like, I can't even write Chinese, right? And so what does that mean? It's, it's, like, it's, it's, it's like, I can't even fill out the form to open the bank account. So what does that mean? It means you have to delegate, and it means you have to trust people. And as we all know, in this market, that's very dynamic, and you know, sometimes trust is a big question mark. It means you have to balance different people, right? You know, like it's almost like a chess game, like um, you know, your colleague from um, Amigo was talking about. It, it is true. You know, now there's Western chess here, um, where you know, and, uh, on, and certainly on a chess board, you know, sometimes you have to balance your opponent, and sometimes you have to look at it that way. We're constantly delegating. We're looking for good talents. This is a big part of my. This is one third of my job is looking for talents, and then, and even if we have highly capable talent, we kind of want to balance them with maybe someone over here who can, either, maybe replace them or complement them, and just so we have that nice, healthy. Um, and, and, and in some ways, that's what you have to do in an environment where you have less visibility than you would like to have. So, in short, would you recommend a U.S. entrepreneur? To do the same as you, to come to China to create a tech company, to be to be uh, the, le the leading at company. Audience, it seems like there's a lot of people already. Um, yeah, I I, I think um, yeah I would sure why not? If I, I think if you want an interesting life, um, why not? However, it isn't that easy. You have to be committed. I mean, I'm, you know, like I mean, Jeremy has a great story about. I, I think he lived on a farm for. I, I remember like a number of years ago. And what that means is, I mean, showing that commitment to really, I mean, it, it's not something you can waltz into. You have to really, un, you know, it isn't like it's just so easy you can be a foreigner. You, you, you certainly have to spend the time, park yourself here, and be very committed. And it might happen that maybe the current project doesn't work, but maybe the next one will. And entrepreneurs sometimes have to think in terms of a portfolio. There's a portfolio of projects. Maybe it's the first one, maybe it's the second one, or, or, or finally, maybe it's going to be the third one that's going to be the big one. And, 
you know, and, and really, you know, that's how we have to look at it and, and be that long-term commitment. And having that long-term commitment, you start building relationships and perspective and all that sort of stuff, which, you know, I, I, I think adds up. All right. Thank you very much, Fritz.